Hello and welcome to Badger Talks Live, which brings exciting happenings, resources, and talent from your UW flagship campus to the people of Wisconsin and beyond. My name is Dana Craig, and I'm originally from River Falls, Wisconsin. I'm a sophomore studying in the UW College of Letters and Science, majoring in political science and English. I'm also a Badger Talks coordinator, helping connect UW faculty and staff with businesses and organizations around the state. Today, I'm pleased to introduce university architect Kip McMahon and campus planner and university landscape architect, Gary Brown. Today, they will be discussing the UW's well-known Mossy Humanities Building, as well as its unfortunate history and future. Gary Brown has been with the University of Wisconsin for over 30 years, overseeing the development of the 20-year campus master plan and all site planning activities on the 933 acres that comprise the UW campus. He's also the director of the 300 acre Lakeshore Nature Preserve and is the historic preservation and environmental affairs officer for the campus. Gary holds a bachelor's degree in landscape architecture from UW Madison. Kip McMahon brings more than 30 years of planning, design and project management experience to UW Madison he was most recently Director of Campus Planning and Design and University Architect at the University of Rhode Island and was a Principal Architect with firms in New England and New York where he provided design direction for numerous higher education and large-scale commercial real estate projects. Kip holds bachelor's degrees in both fine arts and architecture from the Rhode Island School of Design. Now, please join me in welcoming Gary Brown. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome, and sorry about the little technical difficulties we had there, but we will get to our presentation. So uh, today we're gonna be talking about the history of the Mossy Humanities Building here on the UW-Madison campus. We'll spend some time talking about Harry Weiss, the architect of the building, talk a little bit about brutalist architecture from the 1960s, um, look at the current condition of humanities, what the future might be for the humanities building, and then just uh, quickly wrap up with who is George Mossy and why is he important here on campus? So just a quick history on the Mossy Humanities Building. Um, in the late 1950s, the university uh, was looking for space on campus for the history department, art and music, three very distinct units and departments on campus, all in different buildings. History was in Bascom Hall, art was in the education building, uh, along with a, a beat up old metal Quonset hut behind the building. And then music, of course, was in the very cramped music hall. So in the late 1950s, and based on the, what was called the sketch plan of 1959, there were discussions about trying to create new facilities for these three distinct departments. A design con competition was actually held in 1962 for what we called a lower campus, or basically everything east of North Park Street. Um, and uh, Harry Weiss and his firm from Chicago uh, were selected to move forward with the design of the project. Uh, Weiss was actually a designer and infamously known for the Washington DC subway system and other mid-century modern buildings throughout the country. Um, the design competition resulted in the model that you see up in the upper right hand corner of your slide. Um, it was designed as actually one large mega structure uh, to include all three units. And in a minute, we'll have uh, university architect Kip Maman talk about sort of the importance of creating big mega structures at that point in time in the 1960s, but also this whole idea of brutalist architecture and where did that come from and why were we seeing that? in that point all three time. units and in a minute. We're... So um, in uh, 1963, um, we finished his initial design for the project and it was actually estimated to be about $15 million. Uh, the Board of Regents and state decided that that was uh, just too expensive for them at that point in time and reduced the budget down to $10 million after it was actually deferred at least once through the capital budget process. The building scope though through design continued to grow and uh, the design continued to morph and change as it went through its final iterations. And by the time it reached the Board of Regents in August of 1965, there were lots of concerns about not only the design but also a tight labor market and conflicts with other buildings that were under construction at that point in time. So the budget again was an issue. When they finally bid the project in March of 1965, it came in over $2 million over budget. So obviously what we call today value engineering was happening. So they were cutting back on things. 
The design team removed a bunch of the details of the building, took out the carpeting, took out the plastering of the concrete walls, um, removed a lot of the landscaping, especially in the center courtyard space. And you can really see that in today's eventual design that was resulted from that design process and that change of the design in order to meet budget. There were also a bunch of construction worker strikes and material shortages at that point in time. So that also delayed the project and continued to impact the overall uh, budget on the project. Construction finally started in uh, 1966 uh, in a very much stripped down fashion um, and was eventually finished in late 1969. In January 69, the regents were reviewing the project and called it a stark, graceless, and unadorned building. Um, an interesting insight uh, by the Board of Regents at that point in time, um, but it did move forward, obviously, and then dedicated in November of 1969. And curiously enough, was nominated to the National Register of Historic Places, excuse me, in 1974 as part of a contributing building to the Bascom Hill Historic District. That's a whole nother presentation and a whole nother discussion, but I'll leave it at that. So just to talk a little bit about Harry Weiss um, and his architecture firm in Chicago, he worked for Skidmore, Owens and Merrill, a very large firm, um, well-known firm out of Chicago, and then created his own firm in 1947. As I mentioned, he was very famous for his uh, rail station systems design. Um, and especially the one in Washington, D.C. You can see it in the lower right image here. I've been there many, many times, and it is absolutely an amazing space and continues to provide excellent service to the Washington, D.C. area and is a really an amazing piece of architecture. You can kind of get some hints of actually the Humanities Building in the waffle slab ceiling that you see there. Um, and that Washington system actually uh, won an award in AIA in 2007 as one of the only brutalist style architectural designs um, among 150 other American favorite pieces of architecture. Um, interesting also, Weiss's firm advocated for historic preservation on many projects and worked on many historic preservation projects in Chicago, including the restoration of the Adler and Sullivan Auditorium, Daniel Burdum's Field Museum of Natural History and of uh, also Orchestra Hall in downtown Chicago. So I'm gonna let Kip talk a little bit about brutalist architecture and the history behind that. Um, and then uh, we'll come back and talk a little bit more about Mossy Humanities. Kip? Uh, you're on mute, Kip. Harry, you know, Harry Weiss is a much admired architect for the projects that are up on the screen, the DC Metro station has had a lasting legacy, uh, as has the Christian Science Church, Church of Christ and Scientist in Chicago, Illinois. They're really both of, of different types of scale responding to their actual program and use. Uh, the uh, Church of Christ Scientist in Chicago really stands up as a diminutive building among many, many tall buildings. And is in my mind, one of Harry's sort of sweetest buildings showing that he had a real command of both material and scale. The uh, Metropolitan Correctional Center that you see is really one of his first major works after starting his own firm. Uh, and you see him pictured in front of his summer house, uh, which was as eccentric as, as he was. Uh, you know, Harry Weiss is always going to be remembered as a bit of a renegade or iconoclast. He was never a true adherent of what is known as brutalism. Uh, his every solution that he brought uh, to a problem was always in and of that problem. He didn't bring preconceived notions. He, he did, however, borrow from some of the formal uh, traits of things like brutalism. And in that case, those, a lot of the elements of brutalism are predicated on five points of the new architecture that uh, were developed before the First World War in the 1920s by a French Swiss architect known as Le Corbusier. Uh, and, and Corbusier had great influence after the Second World War uh, in American circles. And you can see on the right-hand side, Carpenter Center, which is uh, at Harvard University, one of Corb's really only buildings uh, with exception of his participation at the UN later on. Uh, but this building at Carpenter Center had a profound effect, especially on 
architects and students at the Harvard Graduate School of Design. And, and Carpenter Center is a good example of the uh, tenants that Corb talked about in terms of the PLOT as a uh, French word for columns, the idea of ribbon windows. Uh, you can see the Brie Soleil in the upper right hand corner, which are slabs of concrete cast in place that are, are shading the windows. Uh, the idea of a roof garden, which you can see in the upper right hand corner. Uh, and then two other principles related to a free ground plan and a free facade, which are abundantly evident here at Carpenter Center. The fact is that this is made out of cast in place concrete, which was also um, quite influential on, on, as I say, on American architects. And so if you look at the lower uh, left-hand side at Northwestern University Library by Walter Netsch, who was a uh, co-principal at Skidmore, Owings and Merrill uh, at about the same time. And then Walter's other work uh, in Chicago based on something he called the field theory. Any of these buildings that um, people today look at uh, that are cast in place concrete are generally labeled brutalist, but all of them have these antecedents from Corbusier. You can see in the lower register um, cast in place concrete buildings by Paul Rudolph from the same period. Uh, and uh, I don't see, uh, Gary, I don't see the uh, Boston City Hall by Colin McKinnell Wood. That would be another example. Paul Rudolph being a very, very uh, staunch advocate of many of these principles of, uh, of brutalist architecture using a single material like cast in place concrete. Wh why is that? I'm sorry, here it is in the upper right hand side. You can see Boston City Hall by Colin McKinnell uh, in 1968. Um, and then the lower left, you can see uh, Community College of Rhode Island, the unistructure uh, by Perkins and Will, uh, 1968. And you can see many of Corbusier's influences still in that building. Uh, uh, so the important thing here to remember uh, is that the, con the idea of the unistructure was uh, quite prevalent in the uh, early to mid to late 60s, the idea of taking multiple programs and putting them together in a single structure for higher education to make a what is generally a traditional campus really part of an interior structure. And so if you recall that first slide that Gary showed us having three separate programmatic elements, uh, in this case, in Weiss's solution for Mossy, he combines them all together into uh, the idea of the unistructure, which we see in some of these examples. Gary? And Kip, one of the things we talked about is sort of this architectural style being rather inhumane or um, not like a humanities building, we would think, but the scale is definitely totally different than what we would see normally in uh, typical residential architecture and commercial architecture. One of my favorite buildings there is in the upper left, the Gazelle Library at uh, UC San Diego. And I've been there a couple of times and have been in the building and experience. It is an amazing piece of architecture. And I really think that's what we can say about the uh, Mossy Humanities Building too. It's an amazing piece of architecture. Unfortunately though, it was compromised by uh, significant budget cuts. Um, and a lot of changes happening at the last minute. And one of my uh, local architecture friends uh, told me once that, well, the state just said, build it for what you got. Um, it only needs to last 30 years. So it really doesn't matter. Let's just get the thing up and get it um, going because at the time we were actually doubling enrollment on campus. So it's, it is a really interesting piece of architecture. I can't argue against that. I actually like the architecture part of it, but unfortunately it really just hasn't, performed well from a functional standpoint for us. So you have um, a really interesting um, two buildings within a building. You have sort of these big, large courtyard spaces, uh, very interesting ties and thoughts about the design uh, reflecting neoclassicism in some respects. I had uh, one architect tell me that they were using the Wisconsin Historic Society as sort of a reference point for the new humanities building. You can see, as Kip mentioned, some of the um, columns and the ideas of this very classical arch architecture being reminiscent in the humanities building design. Um, but it also has this very um, 
strange sense of scale and very um, large, huge, big spaces. Um, and that's really been a problem for us from a programmatic standpoint, but just overall use standpoint. Also in 2016, we did some studies on actually, well, what would it take to bring this building back up to code and just meet our bare minimum code requirements. And that was going to be over $22 million just to do the exterior of the building, not alone look at inside of the building and really fix that up. In fact, I think our estimates most currently were up um, over $70 million to renovate the building and bring it back up to some um, sort of reusable condition for us to uh, continue programming in that space. But I would note that, you know, poor acoustics um, really happened from day one in the building. We ended up having to add the plastic clouds. If you've been in the old Mills concert hall, um, that was done soon after. We added curtains to the room to make it more acoustically appropriate. So lots of different things have been happening since day one in that building. Um, everybody has talked about the confusing layout and that this indeed is a building within a building. It's hard to understand where a room is when the numbers sort of stop and start and you have to go outside and come back inside. Um, so lots of interesting pieces to the architecture, um, but really, really hard for us to reuse and adapt to a new use. And that's really one of the reasons that we're strongly considering taking the building down. It's gonna be very, very hard to renovate and reprogram this building because it was designed very specifically for music, art, and history. And it was also designed at a time um, where budget concerns really made the structure itself hard to renovate and reprogram. Um, it really has a lack of transparency and openness that typically we would find in modern buildings today. Um, and this idea of segregating the programs has been really difficult for us to think about, well, how do we reuse it for a different type of use? And you can see some of the issues we've had here, the lecture halls, the dark classrooms with no daylight whatsoever. Very, very interesting, um, but you know, not something that meets the programmatic and modern teaching needs that we have here on campus. Um, other things, just concerns about the structural integrity, the very thin metal, thin panels on there. Again, a very interesting design, but all uninsulated. Um, so you get icicles literally hanging, not only outside, but inside the building. Uh, the courtyard space had been bare for decades until I think in the late 1980s, early 1990s, that space was finally redesigned and populated with landscape materials. Kip, thoughts about this? Yeah, Gary, if I could, the, the icicles that form on the curtain wall are a product of the uninsulated quality of the envelope. And if you think about it, buildings before the uh, oil embargo of say 1973 or thereabouts, uh, when we had a big crash on the energy use, before that time, people didn't think much about energy conservation uh, in buildings. And so it wouldn't be unusual to have an uninsulated envelope uh, prior to, to that real sensitive uh, energy crunch that we experienced in the early 70s. And so buildings from the 1960s really don't pay much attention to that. Why is that a problem? Well, if you have a, a glass uh, uh, glazed exterior as we have with the curtain wall on the corners of the building, uh, the, uh, the moisture laden air on the interior of the building meets that cold glass and it, and it forms uh, moisture. And that moisture leaks out and ends up freezing in the exterior air. And uh, we've been in the top floors where uh, many of the musical instruments that are up there, pianos, et cetera, uh, have supplemental uh, humidification being pumped into those rooms. And of course, that's heavily moisture laden air. And so in the winter, uh, it exacerbates that problem of condensation creating, uh, creating a real problem in this building because there's really no difference between the inside and the outside relative to insulation. Right, and especially not only the metal panels, but the glass windows themselves are single pane glass. And I've seen and experienced in the building, um, people scraping the insides of the windows because there's frost building up in the middle of winter. 
Also, the in-floor radiant heating system in these exposed floors here um, between, uh, let's see, it would probably be between the second floor courtyard and the third floor, that all had in-floor radiant heat. And that system broke sometime, I believe, in the early 1970s, and there was no way to fix it. So it was really difficult, and that just created all kinds of problems as well. So not good, not an, an easy fix for us. Um, and a very expensive fix if we were even to think about that moving forward. So Gary, one other point, if you could go yeah. back, like finally, if, if you look at these barren spaces in the courtyards and in the pathways between uh, buildings, the, that's where, if you remember, we talked about the five uh, principles of a modern architecture, uh, including things like a roof garden you would have likely have found a roof garden in these uh, open spaces uh, to really embrace the idea of the free ground plane, uh, you know, in introducing nature into that. And so with a cutback in budget, you're really left with just uh, bare concrete without that vegetation. Yeah, and it was really interesting. I mean, I've spent time in that and studying those spaces. And, you know, I've often referred to them as sort of these Roman amphitheater kind of spaces where you have these big, huge open spaces with high ceilings and columns and very classical in nature. Yet you would think it would have had some sort of places for people to sit down, some vegetation, some, you know, making it comfortable. And it really just isn't comfortable because of that lack of funding and the lack of ability to detail things. Um, very, very interesting. One, one other thing, Gary, yeah. I've, I've heard that Harry Weiss also had the concept of an Italian hill village. Uh, when you think about these interstitial passageways between major masses in the building, which would have been reminiscent of finding your way through a hill town. Uh, and again, without the romanticism and without the vegetation that goes with it. Right, and you, you can see a little bit of that in the lower left image too, about again, this building within a building and courtyard spaces and you're, you're coming around corners being surprised by other buildings and seeing those kinds of things. Really, again, very interesting concept. Well, let's spend a couple minutes just talking about the future of this space. So as we've said, uh, our master plan process has continued to suggest removal of the Mossy Humanities Building. We are on our way. Uh, the first step in that was the new Hamel Music Center. And that uh, piece has been finished. There is a next step to that, our next phase. Um, in order for us to move the music academic pieces out, um, we need to create that building. But even before we even think about that, we have to move the history department and other humanities uh, departments into a new building. And that's what's in our 21-23 capital budget right now. So that's sitting downtown in the state legislature with the Joint Finance Committee um, as one of our highest priorities here at the UW-Madison campus. We've done some advanced planning for that. Uh, we're hoping that that project does indeed move forward and provide a new space for the history department along with some other humanities building, including our several cultural and multicultural spaces as well. Um, as we also think about that building, we have the art department. Uh, we've moved some of the art department down into an old warehouse east of the coal center. But in order to move the rest of the labs and the studio spaces from the sixth and seventh floor of Mossy, we have to create an addition to that art lofts facility. Um, in order to do that, we have to take up uh, an existing surface parking lot. That's uh, lot 91 east of the coal center. So again, we have all these dominoes, all these enabling projects that have to be completed for us to think about moving things forward. Um, we also, in order to make the music academic project move forward or let that one happen, we have to move the extension offices out of their building at 432 North Lake Street. And those discussions are happening, but again, we have all these um, successive dominoes or enabling projects that have to happen in order for us to really remove the Mossy Humanities Building. And our current timeline is to do that um, likely uh, towards the end of the decade in 2029 or so. Um, also, the campus master plan I mentioned in 2015 shows um, a potential redevelopment of this site for two new academic or research facilities, uh, all with underground parking. I'm sure many people are interested in the fact that we are thinking about creating new parking in this area, potentially up to 450 parking spaces. Uh, it could be um, at least one level below grade and maybe one level up, and then the buildings would be above that, uh, maybe sitting on a plinth or on a raised a garden space. Um, but again, 
this thought of extending green spaces and breaking the space up into two smaller buildings as opposed to a much larger monolithic building that we talked about originally with the Mossy Humanities Building. The site is a potential site for what we call a public-private partnership, whereby the university, the state, um, and the UW system work with a private partner to come in and redevelop the site. We've done this before. The 21 North Park Street development was a public-private partnership, as was the University Square development. So just to keep that in mind, there are some ideas and thoughts. We have not really determined what the programs would be there yet, but I suspect um, here in the next probably six to 10 years, as we continue to move along with our enabling projects, we'll start defining what those uh, programs will be in those future building sites. Uh, yeah, Kip, go ahead. While we're still on this uh, site plan, note that the, uh, the Elvium which is an adjunct to the Chazen Art Museum that you see on the right of the uh, Red Oval, that that is actually also by Harry Weiss, uh, smaller in scale, if you think back to the uh, Church of Christ Scientist in Chicago, a very sweet scale, uh, three-story building that the museum is contemplating major renovations. Uh, we're also looking at improving the envelope of that. And so Harry Weiss is capable in the smaller scale of designing some really quite lovely buildings. And if you find your way into the Elvium, you'll see that there's some wonderful grand spaces built around a symmetrical atrium uh, and very good galleries for viewing art. There's also the Cole Library there as well uh, as the offices for art history. And so combined really uh, three different departments all in one building uh, existing, coexisting quite successfully. And, going into the future should be a successful uh, adaptive renovation for it, moving it forward. So at least part of Harry's legacy will remain on campus in the, in the form of the Elvian. Yeah, and thanks for reminding me, Kip. I think um, it is interesting to take a look at the Elvium building in that it was designed by Weiss uh, about the same time um, as the Mossy Humanities building was designed. But because it was a 100% gift funded project, it was able to move forward with the design details that were suggested and could even suggest as to how Mossy may have ended up if they had the full project budget at that point in time. So you see uh, on the Elvium, if you remember, uh, I had some earlier images of that, um, full stone cladding all the way around the building. Um, the plaster is actually on the walls inside the building. Um, so there's lots of hints as to what Mossy may have been um, if funding was available to fully uh, implement the vision that Mo uh, Weiss had for the overall project. Um, yeah. Would encourage uh, listeners if if you go around the site and look carefully at the major scale of the Mossy Building, and then look at the Elvium, you you can see that they're really not the same, uh, almost as if they were not by the same uh, designer. Uh, and and I think the Elvium represents a break and departure from what would be called in the Mossy Building a brutalist building to something much more human humanistic. And again, that would be Harry Weiss, hard to categorize, hard to say he did one consistent form, but always met his program with a unique solution directly for the site and the program, which I think you can see very successfully in the Elvium. Um, I did want to just spend a couple minutes here towards the end talking about who was George Mossy. I've had lots of questions about um, Professor Mossy and his work on campus. And um, you know, Mossy was born in Berlin, Germany, uh, was a Jewish immigrant and moved uh, through Switzerland and England onto the United States, um, arriving here on campus actually um, in 1955 and began his amazing history of teaching um, modern history and um, became a very well-loved and legendary professor here for over 30 years. Um, he was the first scholar in residence at the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C. after that was built. Um, and we do now have the George L. Mossy program in history here at UW-Madison, and that's a cooperative uh, program with the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. So George was an amazing person. Um, he had quite the history here on campus, um, but he also wrote many, many books. Um, I believe the building was named after him. I see I have XXX there. I didn't go back and look, um, but it was soon after he died in 1999. So I think it was probably right around 2000 uh, when the naming took place and was approved by the Board of Regents. But his um, 
claim to fame or his history really is about um, being an authority in Nazi Germany. And he wrote several books on Western culture and Germans and Jews in the Nazi culture and German politics. Um, very, very interesting. Um, many of these books are still available today. And then ended up writing on male masculinity as a gay man. So a very, very um, interesting history for uh, Professor Mossy and very influential on campus. And I think, you know, even he didn't like the humanities building. You see there down in the lower right, the Badger Herald did an article um, a while back on that. Um, and he was very modest himself. And as there were discussions about naming the building after him, um, he really didn't want to see that happen. But in the end, um, I think uh, the campus uh, really took that to heart. And I suspect that as we look at uh, new facilities and new spaces and the new letters in science academic building, we'll be again honoring George Mossy and his history here on campus. So with that, um, Fran, we can uh, maybe take some questions if we still have time. Yeah, Gary and Kip, thank you so much uh, for shedding some light on this widely discussed building. Uh, you know, I've been in the Madison area for about 20 years. And since I got here, I have heard about this building. And so you really shed some light on some of the history uh, and, uh, you know, topics that are frequently discussed. So thank you for that. We do have a question from Maria Safiati Dale. Uh, and she's asking, do Wiese's original plans survive? Oh, yes. Yeah. So we have um, archive quality images of the documents um, in our archives here on campus. Uh, so we do have those on file. Um, I suspect the, um, even the Wiese's documents um, down in Chicago and, and where they're uh, archived um, also has copies of them. But yes, we do have copies here on campus. Nice. And uh, she's also asking, can you discuss the university's commitment to maintenance of campus buildings? <laughs> Kip, I'm going to ask you to do that one. <laughs> our, um, our need in what we call deferred maintenance, uh, which is the uh, upkeep of our, our buildings over time, is really a two-pronged effort. We have the basic maintenance that we do on an annual basis out of our operating budget. Uh, to fix buildings. And uh, that's a commitment we provide throughout the 26 million square feet that we have uh, on the Madison campus. But there's also a larger uh, demand from our buildings as they age. And that deferred maintenance uh, burden is somewhere in the multi-millions, if not over a billion dollars, that we have to work at uh, in the next 10 years before it becomes a crippling liability. Uh, for our campus. And Mossy is really a good example of a building that has really served its turn uh, in terms of the life cycle of its building systems. Building systems are the mechanical, electrical, envelope, uh, all of those. And so after 50 to 60 years, you can expect that those building systems will run out and either you recapitalize them, that is you replace them, or you have to take them down. And we have a lot of buildings on campus in our deferred maintenance category that we really have to think long and hard about removing. So we need to think about uh, with every new building that we put up that we're also cognizant that we have uh, a lot of square footage that we have to uh, judiciously think about removing. So to go back to your questions on, on maintenance, we have a limited operating budget that we put in on an annual basis uh, for the calls that we get on uh, any number of things. But in the long term, in terms of replacing roofs and elevators, uh, we have quite a burden on this campus as we age. And we need to address it, uh, as I say, start to begin to seriously address it within the next 10 years before it becomes an existential threat to campus. The other point to remember, and I mentioned this, was that when they built the Mossy building in particular, remember the budget was constrained. So the state just said, build it with whatever you can, get it done, get it up so we can start using it. So, and oh, by the way, it only needs to last 30 years. So here it is now 52 years later, and we're really struggling with trying to keep up that building that was really meant to be a temporary building. Temporary in the sense that 
you know, a lot of the buildings that we build today really should be lasting not 50 years, but over 100 years. And in fact, a lot of the buildings that we built around the turn of the first century, so from the 1800s to the 1900s and through the early 1900s, were built to last. And we've been able to renovate and reprogram many of those buildings and use them for new uses because they were built to last. Um, unfortunately, Mossy and some of the other buildings that were built very quickly and very economically in the 1960s were not built to last. And um, that's what we're finding today. Um, as we design new buildings on campus, one of our main focuses remains on trying to build buildings that last and build buildings now that are flexible and adaptable to change and make sure that they can be easily renovated and reprogrammed in the future. And then also make sure that they're easily maintainable. Don't be designing spaces or um, types of architecture that are really hard to maintain. Make sure it's something that we can maintain in the future and doesn't cost a lot to do that. Certainly not an uncommon issue, I'm sure, with campuses around the world and other uh, locations. I, I used to, as part of my previous position, give tours of Monona Terrace, and we always referenced the 50-year mark with regards to Taliesin, and Frank Lloyd Wright had always said, I expect it to last 50 years, and then it will go back to the earth. So uh -huh. <laughs> no intentions of keeping it longer, so we understand that. Uh, Branton Kuntz says, will the new plans try to emulate the good aspects of the humanities building? It may be old and cold, but it's the most interesting building on campus. Hmm. Well, if I could, Fran, just to follow up on your Frank Lloyd Wright reference, he is also quoted as saying, uh, doctors get to bury their mistakes. Uh, and the implication that the building will last for 50 years as an example of a mistake. Um, and I'm not going to suggest that Mossy um, Humanities Building is a mistake so much. There was a vote for this kind of building, as we showed many other similar examples at the time. And that kind of creativity and that kind of interaction among the architectural community in response to campuses and the programs and the needs do spark a certain amount of uh, creativity and response that we want to get from our architects. So to go back to the question, um, yes, the buildings that we design today, we have two that are coming out uh, right away. One is the gymnasium auditorium replacement uh, and the other is the School of Veterinary Medicine. Um, we're going to see two remarkably interesting buildings that respond to program in very creative ways. And so I would expect uh, to, to pick up on the question at hand that we will always see a good architectural response to program uh, because it's really required for us to do that. And also I think a lot of times architecture responds to the architecture of the time period. So a lot of times you see buildings of a time period that are reflecting each other and very similar in style. Yet it doesn't mean we can't have an, a very well-designed building. And that's what we talk a lot about on campus is that, you know, we want you to design an amazing building. We don't want you to, you know, design an icon or something that, you know, is absolutely different from everything else. We want you to be part of the campus and part of the neighborhood, but we want a good building and we want a building that's going to last. And let me uh, Fran, if I take another half minute. Um, we're, we're in a different world today than we were 50 and 60 years ago. The buildings that we, the materials that we use today are predominantly glass. And glass is a material of our time. It's a very sophisticated material that can respond to all sorts of environments. It also satisfies our needs for transparency, for the idea of welcoming, uh, for the idea of inclusivity. And so the words that we use to talk about the uh, collaborations that take place in our buildings have to do with transparencies and so forth. And so much different uh, agenda, if you will, for uh, contemporary buildings than we had even 50 years ago. Uh, just to, to give a nod to the history of lives spent in that building, we have had a few comments posted out there about how these were the best four years of my life spent in that building. And mm. so uh, I just don't want to uh, brush aside the important shaping of our students that happened in that building as well. 
You know, Fran, I think that's probably at the bottom line, the thing that most interests uh, Gary and me about uh, our work on this campus. And that is, you know, I always think about the uh, alumni, uh, the alumni who come back to campus with either their, their spouse and maybe their children. And where do they go to take that photograph? And it's that spot on campus that they carry in their memory and that they want to memorialize when, they're, when they come back to campus. And so I don't dispute that you can have some wonderful experiences in the worst building because you're, you're having a class and you have your colleagues and you have your faculty that really impress on you your experience on campus. At the end of the day, that's why we have campuses. Great. What, one last question. You had touched on this a little bit, but could you speak a little more on this? Why is the building no longer suited for its purpose and why do we want to replace it? Gary, do you want to take that or shall I? Um, well, I'll start and then let you follow up, but it really gets back to sort of the current condition of the building and the inability for us to really um, reprogram and renovate the building for the uses that we have in mind. We've already started down the track of creating a new music performance space with the Hamill Music Center and a new music academic building. So we are already on that trajectory, um, but it, it really is a space that is difficult to do um, any kind of modern teaching or any kind of modern research in. Um, the art department seems to think it's okay, um, but I think they would um, love to have a new space as well, something that's a little bit more accessible and a little more visible for them. Um, and that can be uh, provided a little bit more uh, public uh, interaction with. And I think as we look at the site east of the Coal Center, um, they'll have much more public visibility there with all the events going on at the Coal Center. But it really does get back to um, the cost of renovating the building and the actual physical ability to renovate the building as well. Um, we've talked about that. KIPP has advocated for that. Um, but in the end, I think uh, we have to make a decision that's um, both economically feasible and then also uh, feasible in support of our programs that we have on campus. Because in the end, that's really what we're trying to get to is providing outstanding, excellent facilities for our amazing research and teaching activities that happen here at UW-Madison. Yeah, if I could uh, elaborate a little bit and summarize, um, from a sustainability point of view, the, the most sustainable buildings you have are the ones that you can uh, adaptively reuse and renovate uh, because you're not throwing, throwing those resources away. Uh, but at the end of the day, there are a lot of things to summarize most of what Gary and I have been talking about that mitigate against an adaptive reuse of Mossy. One is the intransigence of cast in place concrete and the inability to remanufacture it for contemporary uses, that is more open spaces with more transparency. Also the significant number of grade changes that were uh, pretty common in those days before the Americans with Disability Act uh, uh, are really hard to reconcile uh, the idea of an accessible building. So that's, that's, that's number two. Uh, and number three is if you remember, we talked about the original program for the building. And in that period of time, 50 years ago, people built very, designers made very specific spaces that a box was meant to contain this kind of program and the box next to it was for the music folks and the box next to that was for the library, et cetera. And so that kind of, of um, sort of specific modeling in a cast in place concrete building very difficult to renovate, modify, adaptively reuse it for a fresh program. And so the buildings that we encourage our designers to make today uh, have a great deal to do with uh, open, clear, accessible, uh, 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 transparent, uh, which unfortunately Mossy is not. One final point, Mossy is not the most efficient building the, and, and by that, I mean the amount of circulation space versus the amount of actual usable space is really out of proportion with the contemporary use. Gary and Kip, thank you so much for joining us on Badger Talks Live today and for shedding some light on, dare I say, the beloved Mossy Humanities <laughs> Building. <laughs>
Everybody join us next Tuesday, April 27th. We'll be back again at noon. Uh, we're gonna be talking to Professor Mitch, who's gonna be talking about the UW Neighborhood Law Clinic. And he's gonna be talking about the work that he's doing along with uh, law students on campus to help members of our community. Please visit badgertalks.wisc.edu where you can see our upcoming schedule of talks, sign up for our email list, uh, consider a donation. We're supported by a grant. Uh, and then you can also host your own speaker. So please visit our website and connect with us. Uh, again, appreciate your patience on our technical issues today. Um, we'll have it right next time. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you next week. Thanks a bunch.